the sermon is titled the gates of hell shall not prevail be enriched as you listen all right let's turn in our bibles please to matthew chapter 16 we will read verses 13 to 19 matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 19 when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth may be loosed in heaven. I just want us to spend a few moments this morning just looking at this text. Just bringing out some Simple truths, perhaps more as reminders to all of us, things that are so important to our Christian faith. So you just imagine, Jesus has been with his disciples, perhaps for a year and a half, maybe two years. He's been with them for a while. They have seen him minister. They've, you know, from the very beginning of his ministry, they've seen him go around preaching all across uh, the region traveling with him, seeing him do the wonderful miracles, the healings, the deliverances, and all of that. Uh, and this is, you know, somewhere about a year and a half, he turns around to them and he says, all right, what are the reports about me? What are they writing about me on Twitter and Facebook? And <laughs> what's all the news? Who do men say that I am? And so they think, you know, Lord, there's all kinds of information, all kinds of things being said about you. Some think you're John the Baptist, some think you're Jeremiah, some think you're one of the prophets. So, you know, all kinds of things people are saying about you, you know, which obviously none of them are true. All kinds of things going on. And then Jesus turns around very pointedly and asks his disciples, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Very interesting. He's telling who he is. He says, I am the Son of Man. Now that's a very important title. Because he is actually quoting from Daniel the seventh chapter. Now you know, in, 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 in Daniel's revelations, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has this powerful revelation where he sees the ancient of days and he sees one like the son of man come and stand before the ancient of days and the courts are seated and the books are open and to this son of man is given authority over all the nations to him and to his saints so when jesus says i the son of man he's talking about daniel's son of man which is very significant so actually, he's introducing himself. Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And hey, hello, hello, I am the Son of Man, no question about it. But what else do you know about me? What do you say about me? Now, Jesus repeatedly used that statement, the Son of Man, over and over again, right from the very beginning of his ministry. He said, you know, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. And they knew that he was self-referencing to Daniel's vision. So they knew that. And so when Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, is? Who do you say that I am? It's very important. And I think that's a very important question for you and me. 
who do we, who do you say Jesus Christ is? There's a lot of news about Jesus, lot, all kinds of books written about him and on, on, on the historical side of things and so on. Some try to prove that he didn't exist and some, you know, all kinds of things. But who do you say Jesus Christ is? Who is Jesus Christ to you today? Now you say, Pastor, I've been in church all my life. I heard a lot about Jesus. I believe everything about Jesus. Well, you may claim to believe everything about Jesus, but what is it in your heart, inside of you, that you know about Jesus Christ? Who do you say Jesus is? And at that moment, going back to Matthew 16, Jesus, uh, John Peter says back to Jesus, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now you are the Christ. That is understandable because that's a revelation seen in the Old Testament Scripture. The Christ in the Greek corresponds to the Messiah of the Hebrew. Both talking about someone who's anointed, meaning the anointed one. So obviously the Jews knew about the Messiah, the anointed one who is coming. Isaiah referred to him as the servant of the Lord who will come. And so when Peter says, you are the Christ, he is speaking from his understanding and the revelation of the Old Testament. You are the Messiah. You are the one who the prophet spoke about. I know that. You are that person, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who will break every bondage will deliver us from the oppression of our enemies. And Isaiah spoke about him. He said, when the anointed one comes, his burden will be taken off your shoulder and his yoke will be removed and broken. So they said, you are the Messiah. You are this anointed one. But the second part of that statement, the son of the living God. You don't find that in the Old Testament. Not very apparent, not very obvious. The Messiah, spoken of very often. But when Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, he added on. The son of the living God. That's very powerful. Now, obviously, Jesus, you know, we know what Jesus did next. He said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't get it through any human source. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Meaning this part, the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's come to you by revelation. Someone up above has dropped it into your heart. You didn't get it through your learning. You didn't get it through your education. You didn't get it through your study. It's come by revelation. My Father in heaven has illuminated your inner person to understand something that is hidden in the Scriptures. It's not obvious to anybody who reads the Scriptures. The Son of the living God. Amen? Amen? The Son of the living God. Who is this Son of God? He is the eternal Word who put on human form so that we could behold His glory in tangible ways here on earth. He is the image of the invisible and infinite God, revealing God to us in perfection so that we could get a glimpse of who God really is. Who is the Son of God? He is the eternal God who humbled himself to walk as a man in obedience to the Father so that we could learn what it means to live as sons and daughters of God. He walked in absolute union with the Father, one with the Father, so that when we see him, we see the Father. He spoke the words of the Father. He did the works of the Father. He fulfilled the Father's will. Who is the Son of God? He is the one out of whom fullness, grace, a fullness of grace, immeasurable grace has been extended to us. He is the one who came to destroy all the works of the devil. He healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, cast out demons, and worked innumerable miracles. And he still does the same today. 
He is the one who judged, condemned, disarmed, defeated, crushed the head of the serpent, rendering Satan powerless, doing all this on our behalf and shared his triumph with us. This is the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? He's the one who ushered in the kingdom of God here on earth so that we who have been purchased with the, his blood shed on Calvary are now God's redeemed, purchased possession, delivered from the powers of darkness and transferred into God's own kingdom. He is the last Adam, the second man, through whom has risen a new creation, a new species, a new race of sons and daughters, born of the Father, partakers of divine nature, who are created in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. Who is the Son of God? He is the one who was dead, who is alive, and has the keys of hell and the grave. He was shown to be the Son of God by the power of the Spirit in being raised from the dead. He is the heir of all things, the one who inherited all things. He is the one who has been set above all things for the church, with all authority in heaven and earth, and at whose name every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There has never been a person like this one, and there never will be. This is the Son of God. Amen? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, Peter, and Jesus told Peter, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then Jesus continued. In this passage, we see the two I wills of Jesus. And I want to just spend some time on that. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he also said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So Jesus turns around to Peter and he says, Peter, he says, you are Peter. And on this rock... I will build my church. There's a play of words there. That's what he said in the Greek. He said, you are Petros. A small piece. The word and, which is translated in English as and, in the Greek you could even translate it as but. Or, it, it, because the word and, it, when you say it in English, it doesn't bring out the the emphasis he's making. You are Petros. You are a small piece of rock. But on this Petra, a massive rock, I will build my church. Let me say that again. What did Jesus say? You are Petros, a piece of rock, a small piece of rock. But on this Petra, massive rock, I will will build my church. What was the Petra that he was referring to? He just, Peter just uttered that. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. On this truth, on this massive rock, on this unshakable, immovable truth, that this person, Jesus, is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The church is built. Many have tried to dismantle this Petra. Many have tried to blow out this Petra. But this Petra still stands today because it is, he is the eternal God. Amen? On this Petra, on this massive rock, on this truth that this person, Jesus, is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The church stands. Amen? Jesus said, I will build my church on this rock. The church has a solid foundation. And I love this old hymn. You know, I wish we could sing more hymns these days, but I don't know if it's been taken up by all of these contemporary songs, but I love this old hymn. This title goes, the title of this hymn is The Church's One Foundation. How many of you people know this hymn? 
really dates us all. <laughs> the church is one foundation. It was written in the 1860s by a man named Samuel John Stone. Listen to the, the words of this beautiful hymn. The church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ her Lord? She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one over all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace endured. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth has union with God, the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, in love may dwell with thee. Beautiful hymn, isn't it? I enjoyed it, even if you didn't. <laughs> the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow, what beautiful words. Amen? That is that foundation on which Jesus said, I will build my church on this rock. I will build my church. So that's the second thing I want to emphasize. Jesus is building his church. And if Jesus is building, if Jesus is constructing, if he is assembling the church, no man on earth, no power of hell can stop the church from being built. Amen? People can do whatever they want, but nobody can stop it. Because Jesus is building his church. He said, I will build my church. That's definitive. That's final. It's happening. Nobody can stop it. Amen? His church is being built. Now, that word church, as we are all very familiar, is the Greek word ecclesia, which simply means a people called out together for a purpose. It means a people called together, not called in isolation, not called as individuals. We are all individually called, but we are all called together. That's why another word for ecclesia could be assembly. We have been assembled together. A people called together for a purpose. So don't forget that you and I, the church, have been called together. Everybody say together. Meaning we need each other. We are a body. We need each other. We are family. We are the house of God. So we are called together, but we are also called for a purpose. So don't forget that either. We are called for a purpose. So when Jesus says, I will build my church, he is saying, I'm going to keep calling people. I'm going to keep bringing them together. And I'm going to keep bringing them together for a purpose. Ever since the time he uttered those words from the day of Pentecost all across the globe, the Holy Spirit of God is moving and everywhere he's assembling people. He's calling people out of darkness into light. He's, people, he's calling people out of sin, out of the ways of this world. He's calling a people unto himself and he's saying, I've called you together for a purpose. Amen? And we have a purpose here on earth. And may we never forget our purpose. You are a believer. You are part of this church, the church of Jesus Christ, which he is building. And you've been called into this church, meaning I'm talking about the, the church, the body of Christ. You've been called into the church to be his own, but you've been called for a purpose. Our primary purpose, of course, is to glorify God. Whatever you do, 
to all to the glory of God. Glorify God. Wherever God has placed you, whatever vocation he has given you, whether you're a student in college, in school, whether you're in your place, you know, whatever your place of work, whether you're a homemaker, whatever you're doing, we are here to glorify God. We're here to show forth the praises of the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So our prayer, each one of us, our prayer is, Lord, let the beauty of the Lord our God be seen through our lives. Let the glory of the Lord be seen through our lives. So you have been called by God for a purpose. To glorify God wherever he's placed you. You are the church there. You're there to glorify him. Amen. We are called in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us never forget that. That people in our world need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we are called. That's part of our purpose for all of us. Wherever you are, God has placed you there so that you could tell somebody about Jesus Christ. You can tell somebody about the, the Lord who loves them, who died for them, who wants to bring them into his own family, into his own kingdom. You are there to be a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to do it. That's your call. Amen? We are called to do that. We are all called to advance the influence of God's kingdom. Right where you are, you live by kingdom values. You live by kingdom culture. It is different from the values and the culture of the world around you. But that's how you be salt and light. And the influence of the kingdom is more powerful than the influences in this world. Amen? And I share this story often when I was in college. I'm not telling you to do the same thing. I'm just sharing a story in my life. And I was in college, and I was, this was in the U.S. I'd gone there to do my master's. And I had to find a place to stay. And, uh, uh, and I was attending a church there. Uh, and um, I let them know. I said, I'm looking for a place to live. And I, you know, I need to move out of this place where I am. I need to move to another place. Just let them know. That Sunday, and only that Sunday, a person walked in. And he, he, they gave him the bulletin. He came in. He stood a few minutes in the service, and he walked out. But he took the bulletin with him. He didn't stay for the service. And at the back of the bulletin, it said, you know, Ashish is looking for a place to stay. So he called me. And... I'll give you his name. None of you know him, so <laughs> his name was Jeff. So Jeff called me, and he said, hey, uh, what's your name? I said, Ashish. He started laughing. Ashish. And I said, no, 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 it's Ashish. <laughs> so he started laughing. He said, okay. He said, okay. Then so he told me, you know, he lives somewhere nearby, the, he's near the university campus. So he said, hey, I have a place. Uh, he had a house, and uh, so the two-bedroom. He was looking for somebody to come and stay with him. Uh, do you want to come and stay? Uh, I said, sure, I'll come and have a look. Uh, do you have a, a vehicle? I said, no. So he said, he'll come and pick me up. So he came. He, he said, he met me. Then he, I got in. He had a pickup truck. And I sat next to him. And he asked me, what music do you listen to? I said, I listen to Christian music. You know, those days it was Hillsong or Integrity Hosanna. You know, very soft and gentle. Uh, he, said, I, he said, I don't know what that is, but this is what I listen to. And he turned on his music, and I was like, <laughs> oh, God, what did I get into? It was this heavy metal, whatever thing he was listening to. So we drove to his house, and then he showed me. It was a nice place. Um, then, um, yeah, so I said, Jeff, I'll get back to you. So I went home. I started praying. And, you know, when God speaks to us, he gives, you know, the one, one of the ways he speaks is he quickens the word of scripture. And so God had quickened the word of scripture uh, and, and to let me know, okay, uh, this is it. I need to move. So I called Jeff. I said, Jeff, I'm ready to move. I'll come and stay with you. Then he said, no, man, I don't think you can be my roommate. You're so different. You don't drink. I drink. You know, so he, he, he checked up on me. What do you drink? I said, milk. He said, I drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I drink beer. <laughs> he said, do you bring girls home? I said, no. He said, man, I, I bring girls home. So, like, we're totally opposite. So he said, he told me, no, I don't think you can, you can stay with me. I said, no, Jeff, I want to move there. Because in my heart, I knew one thing. Light is more powerful than darkness. And I felt I had to get into his world to 
enable him to see Jesus. So although he told me he didn't want, I said, no, Jeff, I want to stay with you. Okay, come. So I moved in there, and we were staying. And I was, you know, I, I just walked to the campus, come back, and he was working, he was doing something. But every evening we would sit, uh, al almost every evening, we'd have dinner together. He'd be drinking his beer, I'll be drinking my cup of milk. <laughs> and we'll be talking. And he'll ask me questions about the Bible, uh, about, you know, what I believed, and so on. And I stayed with Jeff for just maybe a year, maybe a little over a year. Now, I didn't preach to him. I didn't, I, I didn't punch him. I didn't give him you know, a left hook. And, no, no, none of that. We just sat and talked, just lived with him. But in the course of that year, one day Jeff came and said, hey, uh, I decided to go to church. Uh, okay. Um, he decided to go to church. I mean, he found a church. I think it was a Baptist church. And he decided to go. I didn't, I didn't force him. He decided to go. He came out, hey, I got a Bible, man. I'm going to read my Bible. <laughs> All right. So he started reading his Bible. Then one day he came and said, hey, Je uh, he said, uh, hey, go look in the fridge. I looked in the fridge. He said, do you find anything different? I said, uh, I, I can't tell. He said, did you see there are no beer bottles? Because every time we went grocery shopping, he would buy his six pack, he would buy his stuff. He said, I've decided to stop. Okay. Another day, he came back, he said, Hey, go look at the music center. I said, Look, oh, he had this whole stack of cassette tapes of all this, you know, music, heavy metal, whatever. He decided to get rid of all of it. Now, I wasn't telling him to do it, light was dispelling darkness. I wasn't telling him to do this. Amen? And in that period of a year and a half that I was living there, his life totally changed. Now, it's been almost um, 30 years now, some 30 some years since that happened. I think it was last year, year before, Jeff called me. Some of you got my number. He was living in Arizona. He called me. I said, Jeff, how did you, you know, reach me? But he said, Ashish, I called to tell you, you are one person I will never forget in my life. You're the only, I mean, I, and, and I want to say this just to brag. I'm just saying what he said. He said, you're the only true Christian I've seen on the earth. That's what he told me on the phone. And he hasn't forgotten that. Now he's gone through his journey the last 30 years. But living with him for that one and a half or less than one and a half years impacted his life. What am I saying? You are the church. You are called to be salt and light. You are the church that Jesus is building. And right where you live, this the way you live, can change people's lives. Amen? I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying this is what happened. But understand the power of what God has placed in you. The light shines brighter where it is darkest. Amen? Amen? And the light is needed where it is darkest. So if you say, well, I've been placed in this office, I've been placed in this environment where things are so hard, so dark, hey, be happy about it. You're going to shine really bright because the light shines brightest where it is the darkest. And if God has placed you there, it's for a reason. You are salt. You are light. You are having impact. You are having influence for the kingdom of God. Amen? So Jesus said, I will build my church. And then he continued as if to tell us something about the purpose of the church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
So it seems like Jesus is saying, this is one of the reasons why I'm assembling a people on earth, calling them together for a purpose. Their assignment is the gates of hell. Are you listening? So we are on earth. We are being assembled together here on earth for a purpose. And one of those purposes, or one, of, one aspect of that purpose is to go to the gates of hell. Now, Jesus is using Bible terminology, obviously, here. The gates from the Old Testament represented the entry points to fortified cities. And typically, the gates control the city. Whoever controlled the gates controlled the city. The gates of the city were also the place of jurisdiction. So the court, if you will, sat at the gate of the city. So if people had disputes, had to resolve things, they would go to the gate of the city. That's where uh, the judge sat and they could get things resolved. So Jesus is talking about those gates. Now remember, gates are stationary. Gates don't move. So hell is not attacking the church. The church has to attack hell. Amen? I get that understanding. The gates of hell, gates are stationary. The day gates didn't come to you, you went to the gates this morning, didn't you? You went to the gates. So the gates of hell represent areas of demonic domination. And the church should advance there. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stop my church. That means the church is here, has been assembled here on earth to move towards the gates. Move towards those areas of demonic domination. Move towards those places where you see the enemy at work. You go to the gates. Tell your neighbor, go to the gates. You know, you move there. You intentionally, knowingly, purposely go to the gates because you are the church and the church has an assignment for the gates of hell. Meaning those areas of demonic domination. You go to the gates. Wherever you see the devil working, you've been assigned for it. Amen? Where you see the devil working, you've been assigned for it. Don't run away from it, go to it. Why? He'll tell us later why. But understand your assignment. Understand you run to the darkness. Understand you run to those gates of hell. You are here to advance towards those gates of hell. You are here to advance to whatever and wherever you see the enemy operating. You see sickness, go there. You see torment, go there. You see people being oppressed, go there. You see people being troubled, go there. You see injustice, go there. You see unfairness, go there. You are the church. Called to advance to the gates of hell. So I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Let's say this together. The gates of hell will not prevail. Let's say it like you believe it. The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail. Gates hell will not prevail. Jesus has already told you the outcome. Imagine you're going to play a game, and the referee says, at the end of this game, the score is 10-0. You're going to win. Enjoy. <laughs> Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, that's the attitude we should have. Jesus already said it. He said the gates of hell cannot prevail, cannot overpower you, cannot stop you. You are part of the church and you have already victory is on your side. Victory has been granted to you, announced and proclaimed for you. So our attitude will be, as we approach the gates of hell, we are already winners. There may be a battle, there may be a fight, but Jesus already said the gates of hell will not prevail. So that's how we approach the works of darkness. When you have to pray for a sick person, that's how you pray. The gates of hell will not. If you see the, now some, you know, something happening, you handle a situation at home, uh, 
How do you approach it? The gates of hell will not prevail. You see a situation in your workplace. How do you approach it? The gates of hell will not prevail. That's our attitude. It's based on the word of God. It's a good attitude. Amen? So Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. Now why? Because he continues. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. The keys represent authority. And who has the keys? And I will give to you, meaning the church, the body that he's assembling, the people who are being built upon this rock. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Please put your hand, right hand up and say this with me. I have the keys. Say it like you mean it. I have the keys. Now, but it's a very basic question. If you want to handle, do something with the lock, if you want to open the lock or close the lock, who's got to do it? The people with the keys. If the people with the keys look up to the one who gave them the keys and say unto him, O Lord, please lock the lock, what would the one who gave the keys to the people say unto them? The keys are in thy hands. <laughs> please lock it. Are you getting the message? The church has been given the keys. But the church is looking up to God and saying, Lord, you lock it. And Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not saying God is not sovereign. We're not talking about this, taking away from the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign and yes, he will move even above and beyond what we've done. I'm just emphasizing our responsibility because he has given us the keys. Amen? God is so secure in his sovereignty, he's not afraid to throw the keys to you. He lost none of his sovereignty when he handed the keys to you and me. He's still sovereign. But we must acknowledge the keys have been put in our hands, which means he says, you bind, you lose, you turn the lock, you open the lock. The keys are in your hands. So when you and I encounter situations where we see the powers of darkness operating, areas of demonic do domination, what the devil is doing, understand what should our attitude be. Number one, the gates of hell will not prevail. Number two, I have the keys. This is a biblical attitude. Are you listening? There's nothing wrong to approach the situation from this perspective. This matter will not prevail. Secondly, I have the keys. That's what Jesus said. I will give you the keys. The church. That means you come there, to use a modern term, as a solution provider. Because you've got the keys. Are you listening? He put the keys in the hands of the church. You come in with that attitude. Lord, I know the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus already announced it. Secondly, I'm coming with the keys. I'm here to lock or unlock whatever the job that needs to be done. The rest of that verse 19 is very interesting. In the original text, it reads like this. And in some of your Bibles, in the, in the margin, in the center or on the footnote, you will see it like explained. What Jesus is actually saying is, you bind on earth what has been bound in heaven. And you lose on earth what has been loosed in heaven. Meaning, heaven has already announced it, now you enforce it here on earth. It's not like we are influencing heaven from earth, but we are bringing heaven to earth. So you bind what heaven has bound, you lose what heaven has already loosed. But the keys to do that, the authority to do that, the, the right to do that, the ability to do that is placed in your hands, the church. Are you listening? So what do we do? Very simple. 
ask a simple question. Is it in heaven? If it's not in heaven, then you have a right to say it should not be here on earth. Very simple question. So you find a situation in your family or in your workplace that's causing confusion, division, hate, and strife, and all. Is that in heaven? It's not in heaven. So you bind on earth what heaven has bound. You lose on earth what heaven has lost. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. If it's not righteousness, if it's not bringing peace, if it's not bringing joy, it's not the kingdom. Very simple. Amen? That's why when we see sickness, we can say God wants to heal. Very simple. There's no sickness in heaven. So how do you know? I read the last chapter of the Bible. Amen? It's very simple. You don't have to be a theologian to figure this out. Even a Sunday school child can read the last chapter of the Bible and find out that there is no sickness in heaven. He'll wipe away all tears. Amen. So if it's not in heaven, then you're, you and I are authorized on earth to fight it, to go against it, to say, I will not allow it here on earth. But you approach it with this attitude. The gates of hell will not prevail. And secondly, the keys are in my hand. So I bind and I lose. I forbid and I, I, I forbid and I allow, I permit. That authority is in your hands as a believer. And what must we do? Speak words in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we speak that's how authority is exercised. Amen? And I want us to know that this is for every believer. If you are born again, you love Jesus, you are part of the church that he is assembling together on this earth for a purpose. And one of the aspects of that purpose is so that we will go to the gates of hell. And he has given us the keys to do this, the authority to do this. Now it's time for us to bind and loose. To say, yes, I will allow. Yes, I will not allow. That authority is in your hands. Will the enemy resist? Of course. Will he try to put up a fight? Of course. But your attitude is the gates of hell will not prevail. The keys are with me. You can lock and you can open. Exercise it. Amen? Worship team, please come. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist, you're Jeremiah, you're Elijah, you're one of the prophets. Whom do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this truth, upon this rock, I will build my church, each one of us, are established on this rock, on Christ. We are there, established on this. Nothing can shake us. That hold him on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You're on that solid rock. Nothing can shake you. He said, I will build my church, but the church is a group of people. Pastors, please come. The church is a group of people assembled together for a purpose. We must never forget our purpose. And in this passage, Jesus identified one of those purposes. The gates of hell. Go to the gates of hell. Go to areas of demonic domination. Go to the places where the devil is active, doing things that he shouldn't be doing, troubling people, tormenting people, oppressing people. Go there, the gates of hell. They will not prevail. You go with the attitude, these gates, these works of darkness will not prevail. And you go knowing that you've been authorized with the keys of the kingdom. He's already given it to you. He's looking to you to 
Use those keys. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong in saying, oh God, do something. There's nothing wrong doing that. Nothing wrong praying like that. But take responsibility. Take a hold of what he's put in your hands. Make use of the keys. Today seems to be a hymn day. I love this Again, a beautiful old hymn written in 1865. And then it was put into music in 1871, Onward Christian Soldiers. I'll read those words out to you. Onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. At the name of Jesus, Satan's host doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loved your anthems raise. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in faith and spirit, one eternally. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, which can never fail. Onward, any people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. Amen. Let's rise to our feet. We're going to take some time to pray this morning. We're going to take some time to minister. We believe in the Word of God. We believe that everything Jesus said the church can do, the church will do. Amen. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the bondage breaker. He is the redeemer of His people. Amen. And He is at work in and through the church today. Maybe you came in this morning expecting the Lord to touch you, expecting the Lord to heal, expecting the Lord to deliver. Maybe you have somebody at home, a family member who needs healing, who needs the touch of the Lord. And we're going to take this time just to pray and, and, and just believe that Jesus will be Jesus in our midst. The Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of today. He has not changed. The same Jesus who multiplied loaves and uh, fish and bread to feed the hungry. The same Jesus who turned water to wine. The same Jesus who healed and delivered in Bible times is here today. Do you believe it? And we the church are here, given the keys of the kingdom to undo what the devil's done. To undo. If there is sickness, we believe. Sickness is not from heaven. You won't find it there. God is not the sickness giver. He said, I am Jehovah Rapha. So we believe sickness is a work that needs to be destroyed. Amen? And we've been given the authority to do it. Mental torment, oppression, suicidal thoughts, and depression, all kinds of things that trouble the minds of people. That's not from God. There is no depression in heaven. There is joy and there is rejoicing. And that's why we believe that we have a right to pray for people to be free from those things. There is no poverty in heaven. Heaven's streets are made of gold. And that's why we believe that God is provider. That if there are financial needs and problems, we can pray, we can believe God to intervene. God cares for us today.
So we are going to believe God. We're going to pray today. Those of you watching online, wherever you are, we believe God can touch you right there. In your circumstances, in your situations, we believe God will touch you right there, wherever you are. Now before we pray for the healings, the miracles, the deliverances, we want to pray for the greatest miracle of all, which is the eternal salvation of our soul. Jesus put it like this. He said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but lose his own soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? The greatest miracle, the most important thing that can happen to you and me is for us to be saved, to come into the family of God. And that happens as we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's not one among many Christs. He is the Christ. He's not one among many, but He is the Son of the living God. And that's what we must believe. The Bible tells us so plainly that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. He was buried and He rose up again the third day. And because He died on the cross, our sins can be forgiven. And we can be brought out of darkness and brought into the marvelous light of God. And all we need to do, the Bible says, is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If there's anybody in the auditorium, anybody watching online who needs to do that, you've never done it in your life before. This moment, we're going to lead you in a prayer. If you've never done it and you feel the urge in your heart, I need to do this, then I want you to join with me in this prayer. Those watching online, right, right where you are, join with me in this prayer. If you feel that urge inside you, I need to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. If you've never done it before, just join me in this prayer. If there's a prompting in your heart, it is your decision, join me in this prayer. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but I believe you died for my sins on the cross. You were buried and you rose up again, and you are alive today. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you. And you alone. The rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Anybody you pray this prayer with me. For the very first time. The Bible says there's great rejoicing in heaven. Even over one person turns to God. We want to celebrate with you. If you prayed this prayer with me, you're in this auditorium. We'd love to see your hand. Could you please raise your hand? Anybody? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life. We want to see your hand. Anybody? You prayed this prayer with me? Just raise your hand. We want to celebrate with you. Are there any hands going up? Anybody? Okay. I don't see any hand. Those of you watching online, if you prayed this prayer, please go to our church website. Uh, to apcw.org slash ftv. Just write in your details and let us know that you prayed this prayer. If you pray the prayer with, with me this morning and you're just a little shy to raise your hand, you know, our ushers, all of them have bags with them right now. It's called the New Believers Bag. And we would love to get that over to you. So on your way out at the end of the service, just meet one of the ushers and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. I was a little scared to raise my hand. But I want that back. And there's a little card that says decision card. If you write your name and number and give it back to them, somebody will call you from the church office and guide you through on how to uh, make use of those resources in that bag. So please do that. We'd really love to celebrate with you. We're going to take a few moments to just pray with you. All right. You may have come this morning with needs in your life. Now, pastors are here. We're just going to listen to the Lord and just pray and minister together. And we want, want to pray for your healing, for deliverance, for situations in your life. We're going to pray, minister from the pulpit. After we dismiss the service, we will also be available here to pray with you one-on-one. -on -one, so whatever, however you can connect, however you feel comfortable connecting, please feel free 
to do that. Right, so I'm going to begin by just, just praying a general prayer, and then I'll let the pastors join us and minister with us. If you came, came in this morning with a, a sickness, a condition in your body, I just want you to lay your hand on that part of the body that you want Jesus to heal, if you can. If you can't lay your hand, that's okay. Just, just agree with me. Or if you came in this morning praying for somebody with a need, a physical need, a need for healing, just lift their name up to the Lord. Right? I'm just going to pray off first and then I will let our pastors also pray and minister. They may have words and uh, other things. Let's just pray. Jesus said, lay hands on the sick in my name and they will recover. He said, lay hands on the sick in my name and they will recover. And there's nothing wrong. You laying hands on yourself in the name of Jesus. It's not about the person who lays their hands. It's about course we have to be believers but we do it by faith in Jesus name so father right now I pray with every person in the auditorium those online God who may have come with a physical condition in their body Lord we thank you for all the medical help we can get and for all the doctors and we are grateful but you are our physician without your touch we will not be well and so, Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. We use the keys you've given us, your powerful name, your holy word, the power of your Holy Spirit flowing through us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak to sickness, disease. We speak to spirits of infirmity, spirits that trouble our bodies and our minds. And I speak to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I command sickness and disease to leave. I command spirits of infirmities to leave. Spirits causing sickness and disease to leave in the name of Jesus. Lord, let oppressive, tormenting conditions disappear. Let bodies be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ailments disappear. Disorders disappear. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Receive your healing. Let growths and tumors disappear in the name of Jesus. Let bones be healed in the name of Jesus. Joints be healed in the name of Jesus terrible pain because of arthritis or other conditions. Lord, let them be completely released now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God. We bless you. We honor you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And God, heal the scars. Scars. Sometimes there's things in our body that's you know, just stay there. They don't need to be there. Lord, heal even the scars. Just remove even those scars. We thank you, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. I'm going to let our pastors go ahead. Please feel free. Use the mic. Come, come, come forward. Come forward. Come, Jay. Pray as the Lord leads you, please. Take a few more minutes. Just be in agreement. And as we are praying, check and see if the Lord is doing something. Uh, we're open to testimonies. If the Lord heals right now, something happens right now, feel free to come up, share your testimonies. Mics will be available to share whatever the Lord does, right? If, if, if you find a condition that you can verify, don't do it for the sake of making us happy. But if there's something you can verify right now and say, I came in with this problem, I know it's gone. Just come up and share your testimony, right? Feel free to do that. Go ahead, please. Um, I just have two specific conditions um, that's, that I just sense. The first one, um, if anyone has been having muscle cramps that feels like a knot, I see it somewhere on the back, but if it's anywhere else in your body, that it's been an, like a knot, that it's that annoying knot that's just not loosening, I'd like to pray for that. The second one is any condition at the heel or the ball of the foot. So when you wake up in the morning, the first thing, you can't, you can't step down, it's so painful. It's like pins and needles. Anybody 
Anybody if, um, with these two conditions? Okay, I can see one hand. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, I, I see a couple of people. So let's just speak the word of God. Let's just pray together. Uh, these conditions should not be there. Our feet are meant to bear our body's weight and it is to be healthy. It is to take us through the day, not to tire, not to not to weaken, not to hurt. So we're going to just release God's word over the, the ball of our foot, our heel, and this muscle cramp, the knot. And if, if, you're, if, if, you've, uh, if you feel that's you, you could just take this time to just hold that part of your body. Lord, we release, God, we release your healing over these conditions. They may have names to it, but Lord, we, we believe that the name of Jesus is beyond and above all of these physical conditions. We speak, Lord, this knot that's come in as a cram to release itself right now. We just pray, God, that you will calm down those muscles and those tendons and those um, those ligaments that seem seems so stiff, that it's so painful. Lord, we just release your healing right now. We heal, we release suppleness. We release a stretching so that all of these conditions, Lord, are loosened because of you, because of your name, Father. We just command, Lord, uh, normalcy in walking, in doing things, in waking up in the morning, taking those first steps before we go to bed. Father, we, we just experience, Lord, your presence, your healing in these parts of our bodies. Thank you for the healing. We believe tomorrow, we believe this minute, Lord, that your power has released these these. Uh, these uh, muscles, these tendons, Lord, to, to supple up, to, to come uh, in complete normalcy. We speak that right now. We release, we release your spirit to go forth to the, to the bodies of your people, Father, and release that healing right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like to speak the name of Jesus over those who are um, uh, mentally tormented, there's no peace when you work or when you have your meals or even when you go to bed. The total fear and anxiety that grips you. Uh, thoughts that's just like pacing up and down your mind. Uh, just so much of unrest. So let's speak the name of Jesus over those who are mentally tormented. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, yes. we break every spirit of demonic affliction God of torment in the mind, we break it in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, sickness and demonic afflictions and diseases have to bend their knees, have to bow down, God. And God, we just speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over every sickness and, and every spirit of infirmity that is, is troubling and causing pain in the mind and in the body of your people, God. We thank you because the name of Jesus brings healing, brings wholeness, and brings deliverance. And so we speak that mighty name, the most powerful name, the most holy name, the name that brings healing and deliverance, God. And God, we pray that you would just lift up that heaviness and that darkness that surrounds them, God. And we speak your shalom over their entire being, God. God, we pray that every door that has been opened to the demonic activity, we shut it in the name of Jesus. And we just cover it and seal it in the, in the blood of the Lamb. And we just declare, God, that Satan has no access into their minds, into their bodies, into any realm of their entire being, God. And we thank you that your presence just overwhelms them, just covers them, God. Your presence just lifts them up, God. We just bless them in your mighty name. We just believe that it's done because we speak the name of Jesus. We declare the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Paul, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I just want to speak over people who are going through this intense migraine headaches. Uh, it, it's been maybe probably once a month. It just comes and it's really intense. And uh, medicines haven't 
really helped you but uh, and especially during the night it gets really hard and uh, i just see probably you've been crying and uh, you go to sleep just crying because of the pain uh, we just want to speak healing maybe if, if there's somebody here or even if there's somebody watching online we're just going to speak healing against the spirit of infirmity father in the name of jesus right now we speak against the spirit of infirmity those who are going through this difficult season lord this this uh, migraine headaches oh god intense pain we speak in the name of jesus we command every spirit of infirmity we break every power of the enemy oh god and i pray god for your healing right now in jesus name we speak restoration in the name of jesus oh god i pray god that even as they go back they will see that there's a change they will see god that there's no more pain in jesus name thank you lord that your word declares that by your stripes we are healed oh god and lord right now we just receive that we receive healing oh god that that, that intense pain that migraine headaches that come that causes blurness in the eyes that causes um, uh, uh, hearing deficiencies god we pray against that pain in the name of jesus we break every chain and every work of the enemy over these people of god over people who are going through these challenges of god father we thank you for your healing thank you god for your restoration thank you lord that you are the healer of god thank you god i just want to speak about uh, one more aspect it's not a healing but uh, there's some maybe some of us uh, you've been working in this organization and you've been so faithfully working uh, but over the years uh, you have seen others get promotions and uh, and but you have been working so faithfully you have been neglected you have been rejected I just want to speak what we heard this morning that you are the light and light will dispel darkness declare Jeremiah 29 that God has a plan for you plan to prosper you plan to give you a good hope and a good future father we just pray for those who are going through this lord in their workplace uh, a feeling of being rejected or neglected lord i pray that your grace will surround them your mercies will uphold them oh god that lord you will lord come forth in their lives oh god and you will direct their paths and you will lift them up oh god Lord even in this season of oh God where what they're going through that you will be their strength and their portion father we thank you lord in jesus name amen all right we're going to just pronounce and sing the benediction just sing it over all of us the lord bless you what we do in white is Uh, to share your testimonies. If the Lord does something in your life, send an email to testimony at apcwo.org and we will collect them and share them so that we can celebrate together. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up His countenance on you and give you His peace. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.